All right, guys, here we are, Sales Bro Pod with Trey Childress. Is that correct pun- pronunciation there? That That's correct, man. Yep. Awesome. Yeah, so I think this is episode 37, and it's going to be a good one. We've got a, a high-ticket sales legend on this <laughs> one uh, who's really similar similar to me, like kind of gone from, from not even in sales to being in sales to making a lot of money in sales to the – what comes after you make a lot of money in sales, which is something we'll definitely get in in talks with. But yeah, man, thanks for coming on. Of course, happy to be here, man. Happy to be here. So where do we even start, man? So I guess let's start with what what you're up to right now. What are you up to right now? And then we'll take it, we'll take it back. Okay, cool. I like it. It's like like those movies where they start at like the end of of the movie and then you go like, back to the beginning. I like it. Um, yeah, man. So we're both up to kind of the same thing. Um, what Kate and I are, my business partner, Kate, he's actually, he's, he's been on this podcast a couple episodes ago. Um, but we're up to managing sales teams and, you know, I think you can, you can really attest to this. And we even talked about this a little bit before you turned the camera on, but it turns out being a lot more than, than sales teams. And you guys are, you have your, you, you have your hands in a couple of different buckets. Um, we kind of do the same thing. You know, it's basically like, advertised quote unquote is done for you sales management but uh it typically turns into a lot more than you know writing pre-call videos and just helping out with like other marketing assets and things like that um so it's a little bit more than that but yeah man i mean my business partner and i have had some pretty cool opportunities to uh to take on some sales teams and um you know one of them which we came into end of july like the 31st um or like right at the first of august they did around 80 90k last month and this month we actually just crossed uh 550 in cash collected so pretty cool little case study there. Um, so that was super exciting. Have a couple of cool opportunities also lined up. But yeah, man, just uh, managing sales teams. We have our community, which, you know, is, uh, is crushing it. It's doing super well. We don't promote it a ton, uh, but we have our community and things like that that we're still running. But, um, you know, the agency is, is doing super well as well, which is, which is exciting. Yeah. I, I think it was Caden that tweeted, but I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to the case study for the 80, 90 to 500K plus. Yeah. Uh, Cause yeah, to do that in one month, man, on an existing sales team, like you guys probably got, got to work, you know, like that's, that's a lot of stuff to happen in a month. So what's cool about it too, is like, cause I know there will be people that are like, you know, what are the margins or there was, <laughs> what's crazy is there was no additional ad spend. And what's crazy is the Instagram account last month was at like 10 million impressions. And this month is that like three, seven. So not only did we not spend any more ads, but the account is down like 50 plus percent in terms of the reach that it was getting as well, which is insane. Yeah. That's crazy. Was it a lot of, I guess we can also dive into this a little bit later too, but was it a lot of um, like pipeline existing lead nurture or was it just like new leads that you guys were ripping? Dude. So there was a combination of stuff and you know, I'll, we'll be we'll be going more in depth in this in uh, clo- the first edition of Close and Paid News uh, Newsletter, Close and Mail, which I know that you're also a part of, which would be super yeah. cool. Um, so shout out to Rich for for having us on that. But um, yeah, man, I mean, there was there was a lot of stuff to be honest with you. I mean, <laughs> I hate to say this, but really, like everything that you would kind of think of was wrong. I mean, no sales script. There was no p- pipeline, CRM, all that stuff was it was really a mess. Um, the setting process was also a mess. It was, you know, super unorganized, uh, super inefficient. It was really just a combination of a lot of things, um, a small tweaks and things like that that we obviously tweaked and brought in some, uh, you know, great talent as well that, you know, obviously, as you know, um, you know, helped out a lot. So it was really a lot of, of small tweaks and a lot of small changes that really just led to a, a huge, huge result and a huge bump. Yeah. So that's awesome. What are you guys thinking for September? Where is it going to be? I think we can do 800, man. Um, we are, it's kind of crazy. We're booked out 11 days right now. We have six closers. We're booked out at, at 11 days and we're bringing on two new closers. One of them in which he had sold about a million and a half in the offer and he, he stepped away and we just had a call with him today and he's going to come back on. He stepped away because like everything was just kind of a mess. And um, we're doing a challenge as well. It's going to be like a three day challenge. And uh, those, I don't know how much experience you have with those, but they can be, they can rip, yeah. especially with the amount of, of leads and stuff that we can drive to that. So I think with the addition of the new closers that we're going to have the ability to get more calls in the calendar, 
um, I think we'll be able to push for 800. I mean, our metrics are solid. You know what's crazy, dude, is we're booking out 11 days in advance and our show rate is 70%. That's crazy, like, yeah. I don't even know how it's bought. Like, honestly, it's it's kind of um, it's kind of mind blowing, which is which is great. But yeah, yeah I think I think eight hundred is the benchmark. That would be sick. That's a again, yeah, that's a really <laughs> fast turnaround, man. And for a, I mean, it's not like a brand new offer by any means. So like, it's just pretty impressive to get in there and and do that so fast. When I don't know how long they were struggling before that, but super solid. So I guess. Now people kind of know that you, you kind of know what you're talking about. Um, they have a little bit of context, what you're up to. How did all this start, man? How did you become a sales guy? How did you even get into the online business space? I know you're from Tennessee. Uh, yep, Tennessee. So yeah, like how, how did you even get into all this? Dude, so, I mean, I, you, you came from sales, right? You came from, yeah. was it, whatever. so I, I did it, man. I was like, I didn't actually have like any previous experience before getting into this. I, th I thought I knew you came from roofing sales. So I was actually in college at the time that I got into this. So God, this is, this is crazy. But I, I came across like the whole like drop shipping stuff on YouTube. So it was like, that was a gateway to ultimately finding out about all this other stuff. And so I found out about drop shipping. That was like the only way that I knew that you could really make money online. And so I was like, okay, this is cool. I see a bunch of young guys doing this. Like, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna try this. And I was making like $12 an hour, you know, doing just blue collar work. You know, that's really what I've done pretty much my whole life. Um, and so <laughs> obviously whenever you work that hard for your money, like letting it go can be tough. Like spending money on ads and just watching it torch was, it was very hard because I'd work all day and I'd come home and I'd have blown all the money on Facebook and Google ads. And it was, it was, it was very, very demoralizing. Um, but I found out a bunch of guys on YouTube, Jay Rich, Sebastian Georgiou, Biazza, all those guys. And that sort of led me down the rabbit. I actually bought uh, Biazza's course. And um, that was, I feel like that was like summer of 2020. I don't, my, my exact timelines are a little bit off. But I got into that originally. And long story short, I ended up losing pretty much all my money. And I think I was a junior in college. I was going into my junior year of college at that time, I'm pretty sure. And I had to give it up because I was like, dude, I can't keep doing this. Like, there's no way I can, I can try this because I don't have any more money. And so I you know, worked the rest of the year, next summer, whatever. And I came across like, I think it was Nate Schmidt that led me to money Twitter. So I think I found one of Nate's tweets and I think I followed him. And that led me down to like getting recommended the other guys in the space. And my business partner, Caden, who was on here, uh, probably a couple months ago at this point, I think it was in April or sometime around there, I saw a tweet from him and he was talking about like making money as a remote online sales rep and cashing like a $10,000 commission check. And I looked at his profile picture and I was like, this dude looks my age. I was like, what is he doing? And so long story short, I ended up going down a rabbit hole. I messaged him. I bought his program and it's like, dude, like, can I pay you to help me out? Like, how do I do this? And he ended up helping me, helping me get into it. I was a senior in college at the time and I had just... I just bought a ring and proposed to who was my fiance, who's now my wife. And um, I pretty much sent him like everything that I had left over at that point. I was like, dude, like this is like kind of a hail Mary for me because she was starting physical therapy school the next year. And so I was like, you know, we're going to be getting married. I pretty much have to find a way to be able to support us. And I knew that like, Hey, once you start going down the quote unquote, like rat race, corporate job, whatever, it just becomes so much harder than never entering it in the first place. And so I was like, if I can just skip all of that and I can make this work now, then I'll be in a good spot to be able to not have to do that. And so long story short, I, was, I wanted to get into like medical sales, tech sales, like that's what I was looking into. And um, it took me a couple months, you know, I wasn't really making any money, but eventually, you know, I started catching some traction, like three months in, I had my first 5k a month, four months in, I had my first 10k a month. That next month, it was a January, start of the, start of the next semester, I had my first 20k a month. And I remember because I was able to open up my calendar really a lot because I didn't have classes or anything. And then at that point, I started to like pay people to help me out with school and take care of my work so I could like focus more time on this. And um, man, I swear, one of the hardest decisions that I ever had to make was when I it was right at the end of school and I'd been working towards getting a job in med sales. And I pretty much got like a job offer. This guy who had been shadowing, interning, went through all this stuff. He was like, hey, man, you know, my boss who had been, you know, we'd been communicating. He's like, he pretty much is like, you know, 
wants me to talk to you about like bringing you on board and sort of like what everything would look like. And that's what I've been working several years for, man. And, and one of the hardest decisions that I've ever had to make was like turning that down and continuing to do what I was doing because like, it wasn't just me. It wasn't like, Oh, I can just go see my parents. Basically, like, dude, I have a wife now. You know what I mean? I got, I'm getting married in three months. I must support that. And I had some money saved. So I was in a good spot, but dude, that was, that was brutal. It gives me anxiety just thinking about it. But long story short, I, I made it work my senior year in college and um, made some great money. And once I graduated, I was able to, to double down and uh, yeah. keep doing what I was doing. It's a long winded answer, but hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. I mean, there's, dude, there's so many people <laughs> doing cool stuff now on this side of, if you even want to call it money Twitter, like it, it's just not the same as it, as it used to be. But um, that, that's literally how I got into money Twitter as well as Nate Schmidt. Um, and I went the, I went the drop shipping. I went the copywriting route. They're like, yeah, um, do, you know, do drop shipping, but if you don't have enough money for drop shipping, do copywriting. And then I yep. found, yep. uh, uh, Andy, Andy Cav or whatever. And then I, yep. I met Caden in that group a long time ago. And like, I didn't even know it was like Caden. Um, but he, he was doing his like sales thing. And I started, I like had always been in tune with money Twitter, but I kind of faded off of it. Um, just like focusing on school, like probably similar how you were very occupied with school. Um, right. But yeah, man, I started seeing all these people uh, talking about remote closing, high ticket sales, whatever, whatever. And I, when I when I came back into it, I had already gone the sales route, so I knew that's like it's the easiest entry point. But for you, besides seeing a guy that was like, oh, this guy looks my age and he's making 10k a month, like what else drew you towards? sales versus like you said you tried drop shipping but like i don't know like running an agency or like something like yeah. that yeah um that's a great question like actually copywriting thing was something i went into as well like i didn't go into it but i watched a nate schmidt youtube video around copywriting he was making five grand a month it's like oh god dude i can make five grand a month like dude i'm, I'm chilling you know what i mean and so i started reading like what's that book that everyone cash advertising that everyone like promotes and so i read that book and I was just like, man, this is really just like, not like, this is not it for me. I just felt so lost. I was like, I don't even know where to start. Like, I don't even know Brent Econ, like, I don't even, it was just so overwhelming to me because I was just so green to it all. I was just like, yeah, I just don't even know like how I'm going to be able to start this. And so I just kind of like put that on the back burner. But for me, I was like, sales was, I felt like I was always like decent at talking to people. And so I was like, this kind of aligns way more with what I feel like I'm already good at. So like, let me just, let me just try this and I don't have to spend any money. It's pretty straightforward. I mean, I, I know at least if I can just get on the phone and talk to people, like I'll at least have a chance of, of making some money. And um, plus I was like, that's what I'm going to get into anyway. So I was like, you know, at the very minimum, it'll just be a um, good, good experience for me to be able to show on my resume. And at the time, like, honestly, for the first while, that's what I intended it to be. Like I was texting the guy who was like in med sales, and I was like, dude, like, you know, I made 10K or 15K this month, whatever. He's like, dude, you're making more than me. <laughs> it was kind of funny. He was like, uh, what are you, what are you doing? And, uh, but anyway, that's, that's a long story. But, um, yeah, I, I got into it originally again for, for, to try and get, get some experience for that. But, um, I just the skill set, man, I felt like I was already like decent at talking to people. And I felt like that was a lot closer to, you know, becoming really good at it than something like copywriting where I just didn't feel like it was my strong suit. Yeah. What was your, you said you went for like three months and you didn't make anything. Was that like you on just bad offers or was it you learning and like applying? Like what, how did you see yeah. through that three month period? Yeah, I feel like my, cause it was like, I say three months, but it was like three months from like the time I talked to Caden. So it wasn't like I was doing sales for three months. That was like finding out about it, going through the course starting to kind of apply myself a little bit. So I would say like actual period of making money or, or, or taking sales calls, making no money was about a month. It was, it was about a month of like, dude, I took like, I don't even know how many calls I took. I probably put, took 50 calls or something. Um, maybe a little bit less, maybe like 40, but it was just like an offer I got on a Facebook group that turned out to not be the best product in the world. Um, that I didn't know at the time I was, you know, I was so green to it. I just didn't know. And, uh, I was just like, yeah, man, I, I just, I, I eventually I, I quit from them because I just, I didn't really know what was going on. I was a little bit confused. And 
I was talking to Caden about it and like, dude, the, the best thing, the best thing for me that kept me going was seeing someone already doing it. That was like, for me, that was like the thing because where I was, where I came from the YouTube space and just watch all these people on YouTube, I was like, how attainable, how many people are doing this? How is, how attainable is actually doing something like this? And for me, like, I think I would have kept going, but to know that like every day I wasn't making money, but Caden would, you know, I would ask him like, dude, how much money do you make today? And he would tell me, right. And I would just like, that would be so inspiring to me because I would be like, oh my God, like he's doing it. He's, he's successful. I could see it. And I was talking to him every day. And that was just something that was just so motivated, so motivating to me. And it just gave me like a real proof of concept. So I knew it was like, it wasn't just me. It was like sort of the opportunity that I was in and I was able to, to, you know, work towards finding a better one. Yeah. When you, when you paid for mentorship with Caden originally, was it like a group format or was it like really one-on-one? No, it was uh, it was one-on-one. So I texted him and on Twitter and I was like, Hey dude, like, can I just like pay you for a call or like pay you to, to help me get into this? And, um, he was like, yeah, sure. And I was like, how much? And then he told me and I was like, all right, man, like, let me sell some stocks. Dude. I, I like, I had bought some, this like penny oil stock, um, with like a bunch of money that I'd saved up. And actually I made a little bit of money from it. Um, actually like two X, you know, I was like, I made like five grand or something from it. Um, I was like, let me, let me sell some of my stock and, and I'll pay you. And so I had to like transfer money or whatever, but then I, I sent it to him and um, that's pretty much everything I had at that point. And then, um, yeah, from there we, we just, it was kind of just like a raw structure. It was like, dude, I'll just help you. And so we would get on like a weekly call or something like that, or I would just text someone I need help. So it's just very sort of like off the cuff, but it's crazy how that, how that whole thing worked, man. Cause he's, he's my best friend now, dude. I talk to that guy every day. I talk to him you know, more than, more than anyone. And, and it's just crazy. Like how meeting someone on Twitter can turn into like such a, you know, a brother for life. You know what I mean? Like I went out to his house a couple, a couple of years ago for the first time and took my wife with me and dude, now my wife and his wife are best friends. And it's like, you know, we'll, we'll go and we'll take trips together and we'll go stay with them and everything. So it's just, I look back on that, dude. It's so crazy how something like that can turn into to something like so cool and doing business with them and being partners together, man. It's, it's, it's been, it's been awesome. Yeah. I was going to ask you, imagine, imagine you were like, Oh dude, no, like these stocks, like they're going to 10 X, like I'm not going to sell it. <laughs> I'm not going to sell it. I'm, I appreciate the offer, but I'm going to try it on my own. Like imagine if you never would have done that oh, one, like, okay, maybe you, there's a chance you didn't figure out high ticket sales. Right. But also like, exactly you have with your now business partner, best friend, all that stuff. Um, it's just like your life would probably be looking way different than it does now. Right. Dude. A hundred percent. It's like, if you've ever been on sales calls, I know you have where you've been talking to people and they're like hesitant about buying your thing because of like this crypto coin, this stock that they have. And they're like, Oh, this is like, this is going to go up or whatever. I, I have to hold on to it. And whenever I reframe people, into like seeing the value and in investing to themselves and increasing their education or whatever it may be, whatever the person's situation is, I speak with that from complete conviction because it happened to me. Like if I would have made, even if it would have 10x, 40 grand, okay, over what time horizon that would, would, that would that have happened in and like what would I have done? Like I'm not set for life. I'm not like, I just, I have 40K. Okay, that's great. But like I don't really I don't have an income stream. I don't really like there's, it, it wouldn't really change my life all that much. So dude, I mean, it would have, I didn't want to imagine what, what things would have looked like, to be honest with you. If I, Cause I actually met one of the offers that I got on that was good was because of Caden. The first offer that I got on was because the guy was like, Oh, you're working with Caden. I know Caden. I'll give you a shot. Like that's re- that's literally why I got the first gig that I was on. Cause I, I messaged this guy and he, he posted like an opportunity for a job. This is after like the first one that I was on. And I was just like kind of selling myself to him. And he was like, how much experience do you have? And I was like, none, but I'm working with like Caden Jara, you know, Caden. And he's like training me. He's like, oh, you know, Caden? I know Caden. He's legit. I'll give you a shot. And dude, literally that guy doing that for me changed everything for me. Yeah. It's crazy, dude. Nowadays, like there's certain groups and certain people that if you're working with them, it helps you land jobs. And then there's certain groups where if you're working with them, it's like, I don't want this guy on my team. <laughs> you know? Like, oh, here we go. Um, yeah. But yeah. Without a doubt. Without uh, a doubt. 
That's what I was going to ask you next. Like, how did you get that first good job? And it was kind of just through like you committing, being connected to the right people. Yeah. Uh, the first good job, like what kind of offer was it? So I have something else I'll add and I'll come back to that question about that. This is something that, and I sort of call it like the ladder, the stair step or whatever, if you will, but making it in this space. And I actually think you put out a tweet about this earlier. All it takes is one good opportunity to change your life. And it's so true because that was the case for me and not even about the money, really the money, of course, because you can make a ton of money from one offer and you can set yourself up. But once you have like undeniable proof, it's like you went onto this offer and now you have maybe 200 K closed, but you have a bunch of sales call recordings. You got good. Like you can use all that to go and leverage better and better opportunities. So it's like a very like accelerated version of the corporate world. I think the the level in which you can accelerate in this industry and the money you can make, it's just so like so condensed compared to like a normal industry because you can go and you can get experience and then you can just send that to a business owner and be like, hey, I just made close this like deal. I handle all these objections, you know, like listen to this call. It was, I think it was pretty cool. Right. And you can impress people and you can get job opportunities that way. And so it's like you don't even have to have a ton of revenue closed. But if you are like good and people can hear that, like your chances of continuing to land better and better offers will go up. And so if you're in the space or industry and you're starting out, even if you don't make a lot of opportunity, just focus on really honing in your skill set and getting some sales call recordings. But you can use that as leverage to put yourself in a really good position. But to answer your question, um, I was selling like an Amazon like mentorship coaching program. I was like showing people how to like get started with Amazon. And, yeah, you obviously know what that is. Yeah. Yeah. That's one thing that I tell the guys too. That, that is a good point that you bring up. Um, like in the beginning, man, it's like, you're at the bottom of the talent pool, even if you do have sales experience and you, the yep. goal is like to separate yourself as fast as possible, um, by, by any means necessary, because as soon as you have 200 K close 500 K a million, like you're just in, you're in, in a different class. Like you are, you're not going up against 95% of people. You're going up against 2% and the 2%, like 1% of that already has jobs. They're not even looking. Right. So like, exactly. that's why I agree with you too on that, on the corporate thing versus the high ticket. Like, dude, what you can do if you're just like good and you pick things up, you get the right opportunities, what you can do in 12 months in high ticket is insane compared to what you can do in, in corporate. Right. Yeah. So, and, and and I, I can I can touch on that too, and I don't say this to to brag at all. I, but I say this to inspire people and to just understand the sheer amount of opportunity that there is in this space. Like when I started in July of, I guess it was twenty twenty one. I think it was twenty twenty one. I had like came into this with no sales experience, and literally twelve months to the day, I had my first fifty thousand dollars month of commissions. That's what's so crazy is you can literally go from being and that's why I, like, I'm so biased towards this space is I don't think there's any other industry out there that gives you that sheer amount of just opportunity. Like there's, there's so much opportunity and everything really is for the taking. Like I know when Iman and all those guys got in this space, like everyone was worried about it saturating the market. But the reality is like, and you, I think you put out a tweet the other day about this. I read a lot of your tweets apparently, uh, which I do. They're, they're great. Um, you're like, there's such a, there's a bigger need for sales reps now more than ever. And I, and I couldn't agree more like being that we're recruiting for offers and things like that. It's like, dude, like they're for the savages, for the dudes that are willing to work six days a week, seven days a week, and just really grind. And like, who can, who can perform? There's, there's always going to be a gap. And that's something that I've realized. Nothing's ever saturated if you're good ever. Yeah. That's the thing. Like so much of this is literally <laughs> mindset too. Um, because I know like, dude, if shit hit the fan and I needed to go be a closer again, like I, I might not be the best closer in the world, but if I believe I'm the best closer in the world, I'm going to get opportunities that I wouldn't have. Like yep. not to say you shouldn't be as good as you can be. You should. But, um, I, I was thinking about this the other day and I like, we both work with people, um, to break into the space and excel and all that. But like, I imagine you have a guy come from like door to door solar like two guys, same exact experience. Let's say over the last year, they closed a million dollars. One of them are, they're going to be like, I'm a, I'm a closer. Like I've closed this much. Like I'm going to go straight into closing. And I think that person is right. And then another one might be like, Oh, I've never done this before. It's different. I don't really like, 
I don't understand this industry. So I think I'm going to be a setter. And it's like that person's right as well. Like you can really yeah. on how you position your experience and how confident you are and how well you sell yourself. Like you can, you can start way back here or you can start way up here. It's just kind yep. of funny how that works. Dude, hundred percent. Like I, I'm sure you can attest to this. Like in your community, like we both have some awesome case studies and like, dude, there's a guy like Quinn, if you're watching this, you're, you're the man, but, um, one of the guys who really was one of the first guys who, who came, who worked with Caden and I, he joined and it was like, dude, it was something crazy. Like within like three weeks, he was on a 10 K a month run rate as a setter. And dude, this month, his offer will, they've done like over 700 K. He's the only setter on that offer. He'll bring home 35 K a month, 35 K this month, maybe 40, depending on what they finish out these last couple of days as a setter, like crushing, crushing it, dude. And that's the thing is like you, you made a perfect point. It's like whether you start out as a setter, or if you think it's the best way, or you think it's the best way to start out, school, they're both right. Like both opportunities, like you, you're still going to be able to make a ton of money either way. I what I always tell people is, I'm like just take whatever comes across your plate first, especially if you don't have any experience. If you get a good setting role, you take it. Use that experience, learn, study, continue to make a little bit of money. Use that to leverage yourself into a better opportunity within the company or. Use that setting experience to try and transition to a closer. Like, there's really no, in my opinion at least, there's no right or wrong way to start. I started off as a closer. I don't know if, if you did or not. Um, I ended up doing like setting, like later on down the line, like ended up like setting up my own calls and like that sort of thing. But yeah, there's there's no wrong answer, at least in my yeah. opinion. Yeah, man, it's so much about how well you can transfer the competence and the conviction in yourself and your ability. Um, that you, you hit on something, you said 12 months to the day, basically when you started is when you were, you had, I guess you broke or hit your first 50 K month. I know. Commission, you yeah. Yeah. So like you don't tweet as much as some other people do, but I've seen your, I've, we've been following each other for a long time. And I know one thing about you is like, you've had some, some pretty monster commission months uh, that definitely are not the norm, right? Like, everyone's out here shooting for 10, 20 K and like, that's awesome. Right. That, that could be like life changing money, but yeah. can you elaborate on some of like when you were in like your, your peak closing days, like some of these numbers you were hitting, how you were doing that, and what that looked like? Of course. Yeah. So I, I'll sort of just like, I'll start from the top with how I got the opportunity, how everything came about and we'll go from there. So, when I was working at that first company that I was working with, I actually, I think I might've, yeah. Okay. So it was, it was, this was a little bit after I was looking for like new opportunity. And so what I started to do was I started to just like prospect in a way where I was just like looking for opportunities on Instagram. I would reach out to people and I had a bunch of experience. I got I'm pretty sure I closed a million or, or around it, um, you know, on that offer. And so I, I had a decent bit of experience. And so I was just reaching out to a bunch of people on Instagram. And eventually I came across this guy who I recognized from money Twitter. I was like, Hey dude, like I see your stuff. Like it, it's really cool. Um, I've closed over a million dollars and I, I see you like planning on launching a program pretty soon. I know you'll probably need a sales rep. Right. And you know, if you do like I'm your guy. And so dude, I'll, dude, I'll never forget this moment. This offer like truly changed my life. I like that, that is what took me to like the next level of like being comfortable. You know what I mean? Like put me in a, in a good place. And so I, I'm, I'm so thankful for this guy. He's, he's, he, we became like close and stuff working together. And I'm, I'm so thankful he gave me this opportunity. But I remember the day that I, he messaged me back. I was like me and my you know wife now, we, we got, we, we got in a big fight and uh, I saw his message. He messaged me back on Instagram when uh when i was out somewhere just after like this fight that you know my wife and i had had and um from that point it was around two to three months so from around the first time we came in contact it was around two to three months until he launched the offer he was still a couple months away but he was promoting it he was like hey he was like i was i was following him on instagram and he's talking about like on the stories you know how like people hype up launches and stuff he's like hey i got this thing coming it's gonna be here in like x date and it's gonna be super exciting like you guys make sure you like sign up to the wait list here or whatever, stuff like that. And I was like, oh, dude, so it's a perfect opportunity. And so I was, and I picked up like a couple of side, but closing gigs here and there, um, just to sort of like, you know, just make a little bit of money as I was figuring things out the next thing I wanted to do. And so whenever he launched, 
you know, I was like that good because I was constantly in communication with him, dude. I was like, I was booking calls with his competitors. I was like, Hey, here's what your fulfillment structure should be. Like, here's what X, Y, and Z people were doing. Like I was just really doing the most to try and show him that I was committed. And we do up until I started working for this guy, we didn't even, I was taking calls and we hadn't even talked about my com- commission percentage. Like I just really tried to like make it seem like I was in it. And I was to really help him and do everything I could to show him that I was serious and was committed. And so I was just like doing all this stuff to really like help out and, and show him that I was serious. So whenever he launched, he would give me an opportunity. And sure enough, you know, whenever he launched the first day, dude, he did like a quarter mil off the launch, all organic. And he had like, he was taking the sales calls himself. He had like 30 calls. He was just getting people's phone numbers in the DMs, calling them and just closing them right there on the spot. And he made like 250K. And so after that, like war, and I'm sure you've been a part of this where, you know, a, a business owner with an organic following, just as soon as you launch a product, you have a lot of lay downs in the beginning because it's people that like have probably been following and just are ready to buy. So he just like wiped those out completely. But then he was starting to get into the people that weren't as warm. He's like, shit, like I can't close these guys. And so he calls me and he's like, Hey, like, you know, I think, I think I'm ready for you to start taking calls. And so, you know, I did, I stepped in there and I started closing deals. And from there it, it, it was, it pretty much took off. And I think like the first couple weeks, it was like the end of a month and I made like $7,500. So like the first paycheck I got from him was like 7,500 for like 10 days of work or something. And then that next month was 50 and 50. And then it continued to increase from there. And it was such a great opportunity because a couple of things, the brand was great. If you sell brand trumps all, that's one thing that I've learned is if you're selling from someone who has a extremely strong brand, your life is going to be so much easier in product as well. And so I just tried to really like do everything I could to help him out in any way, shape or form. And I think that's something that like, if you do, you will be able to make more money because you're going to have, you're going to learn a lot. You're going to have more opportunity. They're going to be willing to give you more commissions. My commission percentage was standard though. It was 10%, but you would have to under, get in the weeds to really understand why it was such a great opportunity. Um, he just gave me a lot of flexibility and a lot of leeway. And so I was pretty much like in his DMS, I was like setting and closing my own calls. And so we would run these like CTAs on his Instagram and I would just, dude, I would literally be in there till four, 5 a.m. in the morning, just typing up, closing people in the DMs, pushing people to phone calls, closing them there. And then I had like the full day of like traditional like closing calls that I had for him as well. It was just like sheer volume and and and, and, and I feel like work ethic that like allowed me to, to re- reach those months and, and opportunity, of course. He had a, a big following and a big brand. Um, but biggest takeaways from that was I found the offer before it launched, got in front of, got in contact with him. I tried to provide value as much as I could provide value. I know that word's kind of cringy, but I just tried to show him that I was in it and I was serious and prove that I was a competent individual so that he would give me a chance. And then when he did, I closed like my second call. He was like, dude, like he was freaking out, bro. Cause he, he almost couldn't wrap his head around him, not taking the calls and then making money. So as soon as that happened, it was like a big, like, belief breaker for him and so he was just like all right dude like you got it and yeah. i was because i was making so much money i was like dude just like i'll take all these calls don't even worry don't even worry about building out a sales team don't worry about bringing anyone else on i'll just do it all and because I, I wanted the i wanted the to maximize the opportunity and i got i would i could probably find the, the closing calls in my calendar i still have them on there because I was, I was showing someone the other day but i had like 24 calls in a day it was like 30 minute slots starting from like 7 a.m. all the way to 7 p.m. Every single spot was filled for the day. Now I had no shows, obviously, so I was able to like eat and stuff. But that was like a lot of like what the time I was I was with him looked like. But yeah. the biggest thing that allowed me to make a lot of money and have a lot of success there was, without a doubt, finding the opportunity before it launched, providing value any way I could, and working with someone who had a really strong brand. That leverage with working seven days a week and working extremely hard and having people in my corner like Caden who could coach me and help me maximize that opportunity is what teed me up to be able to. And I ended up having a month where I made, you know, like 90 grand, you know, with him, which was like a life changing amount of money to get as a 21 year old. Yeah. <laughs> I was like almost in disbelief. So we, it was crazy. We didn't even have a contract. Like, I was, we had no agreement, nothing. I was, this dude could literally just ghost me and not pay. And one thing about this guy is I would send him like how much I was owed for the month. He would send it to me right there. Wouldn't even check it. Just boom. There you go. Yeah. It was crazy. Dude, 90 grand on 10% commission. So 900K about closed in a month. 
what's crazy is I was doing so like on calls that I closed over the phone, I would get 10 DM closes. I would get five. So I like, it was, it would be somewhere of a mix, probably like four and a half or, or probably average out to like 7% or something like yeah. between like the two of them. I don't even remember how much to be honest with you. Um, but in air best month, I probably, I probably shouldn't say, but, um, it was a lot, yeah. <laughs> but it was a combination of the two of those. So my average commission percentage was probably came out to around seven, seven and a half or something like that between the two. That's crazy dude yeah i don't know i honestly don't know if i know anyone who's done as a strictly sales rep like closer setter combo whatever you want to call it who's done like more than that in a month like 90k is insane um obviously you've got like the money is awesome it's life-changing you probably don't don't even realize how much it changed your life while you were in the moment because you're just like i'm still on this opportunity i don't want to let it go um yep. But you had to, there had to have been a point where either, you know, obviously you're not doing that today still. Um, did you, did you hit this point of like, all right, dude, like I have a, I have a lot of money. Like I'm actually getting pretty tired. Like let's hire some sales reps or like, how did that uh, evolution go about? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, dude. So actually the way it sort of like happened was he sort of started to transition his model a little bit. And so at the end of like our time working together, like the last month I was working with him, I still made like 30 grand, but he had like, it had sort of like went downhill because he transitioned the way that he was doing his program um, where he was doing a webinar funnel and he was, oh my gosh, it was crazy. He had no, no cost. So, and, and I understand it was a business decision. It was, I had these webinars, I'm able to make, a lot of money. This is the only thing I have to do. And he had no, which I understood, right? It's, it's a game, unfortunately. And um, so as that started to go down, I, I was looking like further in the future and I was still making great money with him. But I was like, dude, like you got this thing going. It's going super well for you. I have some other stuff I want to do. This has been incredible. It's been a fun ride. But I wanted to like, I wanted something that I knew wasn't like, because this was more like a personal decision than anything because I could have stayed there and continued to make like 30K a month even though the opportunity dropped off. But I was like, I hate the feeling of being like, this is a ticking time bomb. Meaning like a ticking time bomb for me being like, it's going to get to a point where eventually all that's going to be a little bit used up and because he, he's just like really going hard on this one model and there's not really a place for me. And so I wanted to sort of get in front of that a little bit and hedge myself. And so that's eventually what I decided to do. Yeah. Yeah, dude, the personal brand, I, I was talking to someone the other day, um, because back in, it, it kind of exists today in certain areas, but, you know, back in like 2022, 2021, uh, there were certain business models and certain types of offers that if you got on one, you you were pretty certain to rip some good yes. commissions, right? But now yes. I feel like it's, it's less dependent on the business model and more on the brand because you know, there's a lot of people not doing good business out there, which sucks for everybody. Yep. But it is like still to this day, I think the biggest, the best uh, personal brands are the ones that run up the most, despite whatever the product is, to be honest. Dude, that's uh, so true. How, I guess because uh, now, I mean, I've been a part of it. You've been a part of it. I'm sure people that you and I both know have been a part of it. Starting offers from scratch. A lot of times, unless you really know what you're doing, like now you, you and I and, and people who have been in it, like we can kind of foresee what needs to be in place for this to actually do what we want it to do. But there's a lot of people that come in that are newer and they think they found this golden opportunity and they don't make any money and they're working for free. And like, I don't know, what's your, what's your take on all that? Like people working on offers from scratch. Oh man, like me personally, knowing what I know now, and I feel like you'll probably have a similar standpoint to this. I wouldn't do it until two things. A, you don't need the money and B, you know what you're doing. Because if you have to have money, like right now to pay your bills, it's probably not the best because it, it can be a little bit of a gamble, right? I know with what, I don't even get it, but I know like if you're spending your own money on ads or things, like if you, if there's risk involved there and maybe it's a new product or you're doing cold traffic. Like it could just be, it could be a toss up. And so 
I would say wait until you know what you're doing because your chances of success are going to be way higher. Um, and I would wait till you have some money. That, so that way you can look at things over a long-term perspective and her time horizon versus like needing this to work right now. Yeah. So that's, that's my thoughts at least. Yeah. Yeah. I don't really, I mean, my, does, my, does that make sense? Like, do, do, does that like, no, it does. It's just, it's just like hard to, how do you know when you have enough money? How do you know when you know enough? Right. So it's hard to like Great question. advise people on that. But I, I mean, the safest thing to do is just like, bro, just go somewhere that's already working. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So anyways, I, I want to kind of pivot this conversation because as you mentioned, I had Caden on some months ago and uh, at that time, I don't think you guys or us were really doing as much as we are today with our, our kind of like our next step after closing, which is the sales agency. I also don't yep. think in any of these podcast episodes that there's um, I've had anyone on that is also doing, you know, I guess big stuff in the sales agency space. Maybe I have, if anyone's watching this and I've had you on, I'm sorry uh, if you are doing big stuff, but I think right now, like, there's not really many people in the sales agency space that are doing, you know, the stuff that we're doing. So I think we could really share some valuable insight on that. Um, so all that being said, when, okay, so you, you did start a coaching offer with Aiden. I don't, you know, however you guys ended up teaming up on that, you did. You guys probably were well familiar with each other, what you guys have done. It made sense. Um, and I had started my community as well. But when did it make sense for you guys to start dabbling in like this sales agency model? Yeah, that's a great question, man. Um, I'm trying to even remember what sort of like, how this whole thing started. Um, so the guy that I told you about earlier, the big offer that I was on, I'm pretty sure I reached back out to him because he had changed his model again. And I was like, Hey, um, we'll run your sales team or we'll build you a sales team. Or so I don't know. I don't exactly remember to be honest with you. Um, but essentially we were, we had the coaching offer. And dude, I like being in the game too. Like, cause we, we weren't like, once we, we, once we transitioned from being a sales rep, we were just like sort of doing the coaching for a little bit. And neither of us were like, dude, this is like, this is not it. Like we can't do this forever. You know what I mean? Like just like, and I, and I love the, being able to continue to improve and continuing to learn. It just kind of felt like stagnant in a way. And so we just started like looking for other opportunities and how can we go about like, you know, what's, what's the best logical next step. And that's whenever we came across it. And then that's when I, I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, we went ahead and sort of like leveraged our network and reached out to some guys who we thought that we could, we could work with. And then from there, it was just getting some case studies, getting some credibility, and then just using that to again, like leverage same, same path to the sales rep, honestly really is like, I don't know if this worked for you. I feel like dude, at least from your Twitter, you like came out guns blazing. Like it wasn't like that for us. Like we sort of like were on some offers that weren't as good and sort of like proved their stuff a little bit at least on the management side of things and actually scaling offers from and building out a team. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't like first month we just blew it out of the water. Like, and I feel like for you, like some of the offers you, you lost, that's sort of like, is what it's so, dude, props to you for, for that. I and mean, that was, that was right. sick, but it was just uh, over time. It was probably a six, eight month period of just, you know, working with offers that weren't the best. We got that offer and now that, that offer was good. Like we got a really good case study from him and then we were able to leverage that into some, some better offers down the line. But yeah. yeah, it was just like realizing like, man, we just, I wanted to be in the game. I wanted to scale offers. I wanted to build something like super, super big that didn't just have to be attached to our name as well. And like be able to have something that was just like growable and scalable without me having to be like directly involved too. Yeah. It is also cool. Like having, the, the pool of sales reps on one end and then having the yep. agent on the other, um, which is, I'm sure you guys have used it, but it's like when you're pitching your agency, it's like uh, one way that we're different from other, other agencies is like, we already have our next 20 sales reps lined up, you know? Yep. Um, yep. But did you, did you or Caden uh, kind of 
mess around and just like individual team management, like while you were closing or it, maybe, maybe you did on that big offer. Um, Cause I had a, I managed a little bit. I ended up managing like a team of 10 and then I, I was managing my own team for my community and I was doing that. And then it kind of like just the agency naturally came. Um, we didn't really intentionally push into that, but with you guys, like, um, Oh yeah. What did, what did that look like? Yeah. So that was the cool thing about working on that offer is I learned a lot. I didn't directly like manage other people in that way, but I learned a lot about systems and CRMs and, pre-call process, just like, because I was forced to, we didn't really have any, and I learned a, a ton from the first offer that I was on, but that was where I started to like apply it and sort of like problem solve and figure stuff out on my own. As far as the management side, no, Caden had done a little bit, like, no, he, he had done some, I hadn't um, up to that point, just besides like what I had done on that offer and sort of figuring things out. So no. What do you think about that saying where it's like the best sales reps usually aren't good managers are the best managers and vice versa. So if I, here's what, here's what I think about it. It's a totally new skill set. That's what I'll say. I wouldn't, I don't think it's fair to say that like, if you're a good sales rep, you're going to suck as a manager. I, yeah. Plus it's just like, why would you, why would you give something like that power? Or why would you just say, Oh, well, I'm a good sales rep. I guess I'm just going to suck as a manager. You know what I mean? It's just like, yeah. I think you have to look at it from the lens of understanding it's a whole new skill set to learn and you're not starting like, yes, you can coach people on sales, but that's just one piece of the pie. You have to be able to step back and look at the whole funnel and figure out where there's problems and bottlenecks and tracking and put things in place to be able to solve and resolve issues. And so I don't think it would be fair to say that like all the sales reps who are good are going to suck at being a manager. I think it's fair to say that if you are a good sales rep, and you're transitioning becoming a manager, you have a lot to learn. There's going to be a lot that you have to learn. Um, and you might not be great at it at first, but you definitely can. You know what yeah. I mean? Um, but if you come at it from the standpoint of like not emphasizing those things and it's just like coach only focusing on like coaching them on sales, yeah, you're probably not going to be too good because there's a lot of other components of stuff that be, have to be there in order for you to, to be successful. Yeah, a lot of it, man. I think it's interesting too. I don't, you know, I think – you want to make a blanket statement, like sure, it's true. But at the end of the day, like someone who's a high performer that's dedicated to learning something, like they're going to figure exactly. it out. Um, and also you have to like, I just feel like it's almost like a different season of life because in a lot of cases, at least on our teams, like the top closers make more than the managers. Like, I think that's how it is in a lot of places. Yeah. Um, but the top closers, they're, you know, they're probably just like more on it, you know, they're probably having to take calls at, you know, later at night, wake up earlier in the morning, more like, yep. not, I'm not going to say busy work, but like more work output. Whereas a sales manager, it's really like, okay, first, like put out the fires, but then it's like fire prevention. Right. Um, mm -hmm. and it's just two different things. I, I like, I actually like similar to my community. Um, there's sales training and we have resources for people to get better at sales, but I'm, I'm always, I've always been more interested in like the systems behind doing stuff. So like our, my community, I really hit on like the systems behind taking someone who's nev never been in this space to getting them into a good role as fast as possible and, you know, filling the gaps, but same with the agency. So my partner, Cole, who you've met, um, He's more of like the hands-on, like the sales training. Like this is how we're going to go through the calls and do all that. I'm more of like uh, the, the boring stuff kind Me of. Me too. Me too. So, no, same. That's like exactly like that's exactly how it, is, how it is with us. We had an emergency bathroom break just for those that are wondering why it got choppy. Um, you, you remember what I just asked? Mm -hmm. I don't. Yep. You said that Cole was uh, the systems guy, or you're the system guy. Cole's more of the the sales guy, which is like. That's how it is for, for, you know, Kane and I. And one thing that's cool is like, you can do both. Like if you need to step in to be, the, obviously you can. Um, and like, same thing with Caden, but like, that's sort of like how we just naturally gravitated. I don't know if that was, if that was like something you and Cole sort of sat down with and were like, Hey, like you're going to do this. I'm going to do this. Uh, dude, for me, Caden, it was very much like, 
we just got on an offer and we were like, okay, here's what we need to do. And we just like both kind of went in our own directions. And like, he was like writing a little bit of the scripts and I was building out like the CRM and the pre-call process and systems or writing pre-call video, like stuff like that. So we just like very much naturally, um, naturally migrated to, to both of those things. But that's like something yeah. I feel like a lot of people overlook as like a sales manager. And that's, that's one thing that's like, I feel like comes from that saying where it's the best sales manager or the best sales reps all make the best sales managers because a lot of times that's not stuff that's emphasized and it needs to be emphasized if you want to build an infrastructure and a team that has the capability to be able to grow and scale and be super big. So. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I think too, because the part of the argument is like, what works for you, a lot of what works for the top sales reps is kind of like, it's very like internal um, and it's hard to replicate across other people that might be just wired a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I think, you know, as a sales manager and, and the cool thing about what we're doing is like, we're basically splitting the role. And by doing that, we can work with more people, more teams, all that. Yep. Um, but it, it's interesting because like a traditional sales manager, like you have to do all of that, you know? So that's, that's why I like to run a, to run a big sales team, um, like a high performing sales team, like, bro, that's a, that's a full-time job cool. for, especially for one person. 100% so. dude, 100%. Like one thing that like really excites me and I just, I just love business to be honest. Like, I don't know if this is how you are, but when I got into sales, it was never something where I was like, oh, I'm just so fascinated by sales. I saw sales as a means, as a, as a way to get me to being able to do stuff that I really want to do. Um, not to say I don't love it because I do and I'm very thankful for it, but I just love business in general. And so that was one thing that like, whenever we started the agency, I was so excited about is cause I was like, dude, this is something that like we can grow and scale. We can hire people and we can like eventually there's an end in sight, meaning like we can get to a point where like, once we have the systems and things built out for certain clients and prospects, we have people that can sort of oversee the accounts and help us out with the day-to-day -day stuff to relieve a lot of that, like, you know, initial stress and, um, and workload, which is like so exciting to me. I, for some reason, I'm just like fascinated by that. Um, to, cause I've never like had anything like that where I've scaled it and outsourced myself and been able to be like, I hate the word overseer, but like you, I think you know what I'm trying to say. So that, that's something that I love yeah. about the sales agency. And, and plus like, dude, there's not a lot of people doing it. Like there's us and there's a couple other guys doing it. Devante, Rich, Ryan, like all those guys are, are great and, and killers as well as along with you and Cole. Um, but there's not, there's not a lot of people doing it. There's a huge demand for it. And what's cool. And I think you guys have had the same experience is it's all word of mouth. Our little bit of clients, all word of mouth. Now, have I texted people that are in my network and pitched them? Absolutely. But nonetheless, I think all the clients that we are, are now working with have been all came through in some way, shape or form, like a word of room sort of referral thing. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. It's, it's hard, man, especially in offers that are already going, like, I don't know how much you guys charge and I'm not going to like get into too much of that on here, but like we, we're not cheap, you know? Oh. And so it's, it's like, uh, to go to someone who's already doing a hundred, 200, 300 K a month and be like, Oh yeah. Like give us this super big percentage of your business. Like, it's a tough sell. That's why like you, you've got to have the network. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's kind of how Cole and I even partnered up. Well, originally we, we partnered up on something completely different, which is kind of on pause. We're ramping it back up. Um, but then while we, we were looking for like, okay, while we pause this, like, what do we both know that we can spin up and, and grow and like a real business. Right. And it was, I mean, sales agency was the low hanging fruit, but, um, uh, yeah, man, it's a, uh, it's definitely, it's definitely not a beginner business model either. Like, no. I mean, we talk about remote setting closing, like that's pretty entry level, but I would say like, dude, I've, I've, I've started agencies, I've signed clients, nothing crazy and I've done fulfillment, but I will say like sales agency is a very, it's a very like operationally complex yes. thing. Um, and yeah, man, it's, it's not for the faint of heart. And I made, I think I made a video on this the other day, but like, if you're looking at all these different business models and profit margins and all that, like, I feel like sales agency is, it typically has one of the lower like ends of that because you have to fit into this, like this, I don't know, 
allocated percentage that a business owner has for sales. And then you have to pay if you're paying a team out of that, pay a team out of that, but you make up for it in, in volume and being able to do more. So it's, it's a very interesting model. Um, even a small I percentage, mean, like e even a small percentage on a big number still comes out to be a lot of money, you know, and obviously exactly. the bigger the number, it, it gets bigger. But there was something else I was going to talk to you about. Have you seen people try and spin that as a biz op? They're like, be a fractional sales manager. Like, what are your what are your thoughts? I think it's hilarious, but like, what are your thoughts on it? I mean, I I think there's value in coaching at every level, but it just depends who they're marketing to. Beginner. No, I, the ones but, I saw are like beginners. At least the way that their marketing portrayed it, it seemed like they were like marketing for people to be zero to one and be like a, a fractional. That's at least how I interpreted it. Could have been wrong. Could have been wrong. Yeah. No, no, that's like, that's pretty insane. Um. But like if I, if I, you know, if you're making 10K a month as a closer and you want the next step, like by all means, you know, go, go do something like that. But yeah, I have seen a couple of people, I get their ads um, that are, I, have, I don't even like watch them, but yeah, they're pitching that as like a biz op. It's freaking crazy. Um, I don't know, dude, like doing cold outreach. We, we have not, that's one thing we haven't done. We haven't done cold outreach. We haven't run cold email. We haven't done ads. We're we're like ramping some stuff up now, but, um, dude, we're, we're at like, as we're talking right now, we have like five clients that are basically, and we're trying to like green light to onboard and like start and scale. And we're just trying to work out like the logistics, like which one first, who's doing what, um, like we're pretty much like waitlisted right now, which is crazy offer referrals. So <laughs> my dog is there. My dog is going insane. Yeah, I had a, my dog got taken out of my apartment for this because she goes crazy in the back. <laughs> that is a very smart idea. Um, so yeah. sorry guys, please, please ignore that. But yeah, to your point, uh, we're sort of at that point. We have five clients as well. Um, so we're sort of at that point as well. And it can be very overwhelming, especially whenever you're onboarding a client and you maybe you onboard a couple of clients at one time, which Katie and I, kind of in doing right now and it's just like you're scrambling on so many different things and it's so it's so stressful but also dude like I, I really really enjoy it like I would way rather have like a lot on my plate than have like nothing on my plate and so yeah. you know whenever I'm like stressed or whatever I always just like you know reframe reframe my beliefs around that um and it's a sticky yeah. service too that's what's so cool about it is like I feel like obviously pinning that you're good and you guys are um, heard great things about, you know, you guys, and obviously I've seen a lot of what you guys have done, but whenever you're good, like it's very sticky because it's a hard thing and an overwhelming thing for a business owner to like remove you from and replace you with, especially like whenever you have your own team and your own processes and your own things coming in, like it's a, it's a lot. And that's, what's so cool about it is like, it's very sticky and it only takes a couple a handful to make a lot of money. Yeah, man. I, I don't know like the full way that you structure things, but we come in with like, we we're paying for all the tech, the CRM call recording. We build out all the sequences. We run it. We pay for the, the SMS, the call, all that stuff. I and mean, we bake it into our price, but like, bro, if a business owner like wants to get rid of us, they're, they're literally like, we're, we're even hosting like the intake forms with the marketing. And then the, we have like, everything rigged up in our CRM with a closed deal. And then it extends email access to whatever they need. Like if a business owner is just like, Hey guys, we want to stop using this. It's like, okay, man, like have fun rebuilding for the next 60, 90 days, which actually I was, we we're on a client or a, a sales call today with someone we're looking to potentially pick up. And I was, I was thinking about like our past clients and all that. And it's like all the clients that we have, churned were because we broke off the relationship like we haven't had anyone say hey you guys suck like get out of here or we're just done so it's it is very very sticky which is uh something you should look for when you're running a business but it's, it's very stressful too dude like i my like stress levels are uh way higher now than they were when i was a closer by probably about 10. <laughs> it's yeah. like there's i feel like there's always problems there's always things going on there's always like there's just there's always something for sure 
And whenever oh, you're wow. managing a, a huge like team of sales reps, there's, I feel like everyone all, always needs something. And so you're just always like constantly in communication with clients or sales reps. There's always, there's always something going on. You know, like this morning I was driving my wife to a doctor's appointment and a closer, you know, calls me. It's like, there was, it, for some reason, like one of the links had like messed up, like one of the payment links. And uh, so he called me and I'm like on my phone creating like an $8,000 link. And like, you know, as I'm driving and like, you know what I mean? It's just, it's just one of those things where I mean, you got to do what you got to do. Right. But um, it's worth it and it's fun and it's stressful, yeah. but it's rewarding. Yeah. It's stressful. Are you guys at the point where you're, you're hiring people like to work in the agency, whether it's like on salary or like, um, like example, like we just hired a bookkeeper and before it was just setters, closers, we take care of it. We just hired a bookkeeper full time. Like, do you guys have any hires like that? We literally just talked about that like a couple of days ago. Um, we, we're going to have to, you know what I mean? It's almost yeah. like, it's just, you get to that point where you're like, I literally can't even like, we just, it just has to be done. I don't care. We, it just has to be done. And so we're at that point now where we're like going ahead and getting like just super official on the legal side, but also like, um, on like the taxes side as well and making sure we're staying organized there. Cause that's something by nature. I'm just not very, not very good at or on top of. Yeah. I think the biggest for anyone who, uh, is looking for their next business, their next like, yeah, business idea. I think the biggest headache for us in running the sales agency across multiple accounts and like looking to scale is the process of invoicing and paying commissions to the sales reps because there's so many variables and then there's different pay cycles and payout cycles and all this stuff. Um, so if there's any like guys looking for their next business idea to solve that problem, we'll probably make a good amount of money. You know what's funny? Kate and I have a software built on that. It's called. Okay, so you guys don't have that problem? No, 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 no. It's kind of funny. So we started that and it got built around the time we got into the agency game. And so we sort of put it on the back burner a little bit. But yeah, we had Alex and his team, no code Alex, spin up a software and it was basically a software for tracking and paying out commissions to sales reps. And um, that's like exactly what it did sync with payment processors. And like, I don't even. The whole tech, I mean, I don't even remember specifically like how the functions of it all worked, but it would track specifically for each sales rep who closed each deal and it would attribute to them. And then it would track their payment plans and it would formulate out to this like exact number on how much they collected and a breakdown of it all. It was pretty cool. Um, we just didn't have the time. We just had too much on our plate. And so we had to sort of put it on the back burner a little bit, but we have that and Hopefully in the future we can we can roll it out and honestly you probably even use it internally first to be honest yeah because that is a yeah. problem that's, that's um I was talking to someone yesterday about kind of just like okay dude like what what is next like I mean not to say like you know the sales agency's tapped out but it's like guys like us like you're always just kind of like looking out like what what comes after this right and I feel like you know the inevitable point like the inevitable destination is is like something software right yeah. so um i don't know i don't know like do you guys have any intention with with your agency in particular to to run it for a certain amount of time to build it for to sell like what, what do you guys kind of envision there not to build to sell um the specifics of i feel like there's a lot of complexity there I feel like it would be a, a, a difficult business to sell. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, if there's any PE guys watching this that like would be interested in buying a buying a sales agency, definitely definitely reach out. Not at that point where I'd even consider it or entertain it. I'm sure you're not at the point either, because um, it doesn't probably wouldn't make sense for either party. But more so just cash flow. Like I I think long term, like I could see this being something that's like a five to ten year thing. Maybe not ten, but for sure like five. I, I definitely think that this could be something that we grow, say to grow and scale for the next five years. I think our plan is we want to keep a very, when I say small, I mean five-ish, like a handful of just clients that we can scale like multiple millions a month with. And because like, you know, at that point, you know, you're doing $15 million a month. You're in a, you're in a really good spot in terms of like what you're yeah. making. Um, 10 million a month. 
And so we just want to continue to scale all of our accounts and then obviously bring on actual like other sales reps or autom people with good our automations and systems to sort of help delegate and offer the, the work a little bit and hopefully get it to a point where it's not as much on air plate and we can have that running and growing and scaling in the background. And again, would never be like completely hands off from it. But then at that point, if you want to focus on a software or whatever you want to do, you'll have the bandwidth to be able to do that. Yeah. Who knows? What's, what's the, what's like the big goal for you? Like, it's a great question. I, I mean, I, I love like sales and it's created me this life that I didn't think I'd be living. And it seems like the same with you. Um, like, what do you, what do you want to do? What do you want to be doing in like 10, 20, 30 years? Love that question. Oh man, it's such a, it's such a great question. It gets me excited. Um, to like, I've always grown up around real estate. Like that's what like my dad and my grandfather did. They, they own real estate. And so I always grew up around that and I was like fascinated by it. And so, and again, even over the last 12 months, I've started like make offers on properties and things. Of course, with interest rates and everything like right now, I don't think it's necessarily the best time to buy. I'm not an expert by any means, but uh, I'm just sort of being patient a little bit. Um, but I think that's what I want to do. I think that's my plan. I think over the next five years, we continue to grow and scale the agency. Um, and we get that to a point where it's, you know, really, really doing well. And then at that point can start accumulating real estate and maybe software along the way. Um, I think I don't see myself in the next 10 years, not being in some way, shape or form, being involved in real estate is like being something like major that I'm involved. In. I think that's probably the long term play for me. What about you, though? Yeah. Same. Um, dude, the more I get into business and stuff, I, I did want to get into real estate and I, I will get into real estate. But I do see the attraction behind like like the stock portfolios, the private equity stuff, sure, absolutely, uh, all that, just because it's like yep. literally hands off. And I, th I feel like with real estate, again, like, dude, you could do really freaking well and I will probably be in real estate soon. But, uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of variables that could happen. Of course. Um, and real estate, a lot of times people are like, Oh, it's, it's passive. It's, it's hands off. Like no, it's not dude. Like it's not. It's not. Um, so that's why like it does need to be you need to have the attention to to pay that kind of stuff um but yeah man i don't know like a similar spot as you like cash flow the agency build it as big as we can put the money in smart places yep. and then set myself up to where if i don't want to run the agency i don't have to that's that's exactly that's exactly the plan um and that's like what's so at least what i'm working towards is having my complete lifestyle and income paid with by some form of like assets, whether it's businesses that I own, yeah. whether it's buying an accounting firm or whether it's, you know, do, going down the private equity model where, you know, you're buying a stake in businesses and growing like the, the acquisition.com or Rosie playbook. Like, and that's what, I don't think it's so cool about what we're doing here is like, we're literally scaling the crap out of these businesses. And it's like, you can just apply that to like businesses that you have equity in, um, different brick and mortar type, like whatever, right? There's just so, so many ways you can go about leveraging that experience. Uh, but ultimately my goal, I think long-term is just getting to a point now where like my, a good life is completely paid for by real estate or by some form of, and then that way, anything you want to do is a cherry on top and you're not handcuffed to anything that you decide you don't want to do or partaking anymore in the future. I feel like yeah. that's like quote unquote exit velocity, if you will. Um, but even like, I'll, I'll share what I've, what I've been looking into a little bit, but mobile home parks, I don't know, like some people might immediately write that off, but dude, like. In my family, you know, is, is involved in mobile home parks. Like, the, you know, my mom and dad have one. And it's basically set up to where they don't actually own the trailers. It's just that they just rent out the lots, you know, and it's very, very well kept, very well. You know, it's it's very nice. Everyone in there is over 55. So you don't have, like, young people in there causing a bunch of trouble. So it's older people. They have nice big lots. They take care of their own lots. It's really the only thing that he's managing is just the roads and making sure everything's, like, clean and taken care of. And it's, like, a cash cow but it's also like really yeah. hands off, which is like, but a, not a lot of people even look into it because it looks so rough on the front end or they hear it and they think yeah. it's trashy or diff there's going to be, it's going to be like that with everything, but that's, that's the asset class that I'm looking into within real estate. Um, dude, dude, let me know if you need some investors. <laughs> I've, I've definitely heard about, um, I think, is it the, the bigger pockets guy? Uh, 
I don't remember his name, but he's, I think he owns some mobile, mobile home parks. Um, and I've heard him, I, I used to like listen to bigger pockets. Like I was like really about to get into real estate yeah. before I got into like the remote closing space, like after my other sales job. Um, and I was like, nah, like, let me get some more working capital. And then here we are. Yeah. But, um, my crazy dog is about to come back in the apartment. So it's probably a good, good spot to wrap it up. Um, if, People want to connect with you. Where's the best place to do that? Uh, Twitter, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, my handle is at ACHLDRSS. So find me on Twitter, cool. find me on Instagram at that handle. I'm on YouTube there as well. And uh, should be a message. Happy to help you know, any way I can. Nice. Yeah, I'll link it all below in the description. Cool. Um, well, yeah, appreciate you coming on, man. It's been a good one. Make sure this gets out in a couple of days and go from there. Awesome. Yeah, appreciate you having me, man. It was was a great time and hopefully you know if you're watching this you got some value from it yeah there's no way they didn't get value from this this is, this is a good one so thanks for watching y'all yeah. peace